Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host for episode 102. Thanks everybody for tuning in. As you can see, I've got a little bit different surroundings. I thought I'd change up the set a little bit, maybe move away from the green screen and uh, make it a little bit more cozy as I continue to do the show. So hopefully you like this and I'll continue to probably modify it as I go along. Uh, thanks everybody for listening to episode 100. It was a pretty monumentous occasion for me clipping that level and uh, the feedback was very positive. So I thank you for this. So I've got a few stories I'm going to talk about today. Let me get right into it. First story really is covering the uh, plug-in sales globally, as everybody knows that I do. I continue to watch those numbers, and they are still remaining fairly strong. They are, of course, under year over year from last year, which is to be expected, but still relatively doing well. And no uh, surprise that Tesla is still leading the pack as far as sales go, especially with the Model 3. And now with the Model Y release, that should help a lot. So in June of uh, this year, at the end of the uh, second quarter, there was 230,000 plugins sold globally, which again is about 22% less than year over year last year, but uh, still uh, positive when you compare that to the rest of the automobile market. Um, so the total for the first half of 2020 was about 950,000 plugins. So of course, well short of a million or a million two, million three, which is what we would need to get to to be at par for last year, which was about two, just under 2.3 million plugins globally total. Now, there is good news, of course, that uh, Tesla continues to ramp up production, especially in the Model Y, which should be hitting this, which is hitting the streets and is going to hit more streets and more markets uh, globally as we move forward into this year. Tesla number one manufacturer, no doubt, with just under, uh, just over uh, 179,000 units year to date. Now, Elon has said he wants to do 500,000 vehicles this year. Now that uh, China is up and cranking, They've got the uh, the second lines going in Fremont and uh, all this other stuff. Good news. Uh, let's uh, I'll continue to monitor it and see how the year goes. But right now, it continues to look uh, very on the uh, positive side. With all these EV sales, people are asking, "Gee, can the grids really handle this?" Well. Yes, they can, but it depends on where you live and what the infrastructure is like. So it's not going to be the same everywhere. But as an example, there's a study that was done by Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the U.S. And they calculated how many EVs the grid could handle if all of a sudden there was a flood of EVs into the United States. Could they handle it? And they predicted that about 24 million EVs could be supported with the current U.S. power grid, and that would be until about 2028, until the, almost the end of this decade. Um, so that's a pretty good number of 24 million EVs. Remember, the U.S. only has about 1.5 million EVs on the road today, so there's a ton of growth there. You could sell well over 20 million and not even impact today's current power grid, never mind what's going on for future expansion and new technologies and, and refreshes and all this kind of stuff that's going on. So remember, power plants, uh, transmission lines, solar generation is increasing in houses, all this kind of stuff is going to help continue to make the grid um, a very positive as far as it's supporting EVs in the future. And according to some of their numbers, they say that if the U.S. continues to refresh and enhance the power grid, that they could deal with in upwards of 65 million EVs. Uh, and that's if people were staggering their power charging. So if everybody went to charge at one time, let's say at midnight, everybody plugged in, uh, at midnight Eastern time across the states, the, the, the grid could still handle it. But if everybody was staggered in their charging, they could actually support triple the number of EVs today. So all good news, and let's continue to watch that, how it rolls out in other countries. Quick note about Rivian. Uh, people are kind of diving into their reservation tools and some of the data sets that they've been able to find. And they've been able to determine that Rivian for the R1T has about 30,000 buyers or so, roughly, plus or minus some numbers there, of people that are waiting in the links to, uh, to get these vehicles. Um, remember, it's a $1,000 deposit on this, so you have to actually put some money in there like it was for the Model 3 and so forth before, um, and not like 100 bucks for the Cybertruck. Now I know people are going to say, hey, Cybertruck's got over a million now, it's going great. Excellent. But, you know, 100 bucks isn't as strong as a deposit as 1000 bucks is. Not to say that Tesla's not going to sell a million of them. I hope they sell millions. I really hope they go crazy with the Cybertruck. But I'm just saying that Rivian, it's a little bit trickier. Um, and and uh, these numbers support that these are more uh, concerned buyers that are looking at the Rivian trucks. So right now, again, they're tentatively looking to start deliveries into 2021, but I'll keep you posted on these numbers and their situation. 
staying in pickup trucks. I talked about Lordstown Motors before, kind of another startup that's going on in the pickup truck. Well, uh, their endurance model, that's what they call their all electrified pickup truck. They've actually released a video, as you can see rolling here, um, with their uh, model and uh, getting more done. I like it when there's video, when there's actually real products to talk about, not just uh, renderings and stuff. So I'm really glad that they're moving forward with, uh, with more stuff here. Um, so they are predicting deliveries in the summer of 2021 sometime, let's say summer to second half, well into the second half of next year. But, you know, they're talking about towing and off-road driving capabilities and that you can even plug in some power tools to charge up and all that kind of stuff. So they are currently in the alpha production phase. That's what I would classify this as they continue to roll down into the beta production and then into pre-production and so forth. So they're getting there. Um, this, these are going to be built in a plant in Ohio. And it's interesting, though, we have to keep our eyes on Lordstown because there is a, an investment perspective. You know, they only have so much cash, so I don't know where they're getting um, any of their funding and where they're looking to source future funding because what they're doing is very capital intensive, as we all know, a la watching Tesla go through this whole process. So we'll have to probably be hearing something soon about some investing uh, possibilities or where they're going to the market to get more cash to continue building this out. So wait and see what happens. If anybody's got one of these on order or they've got more intel to share, please put it in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. I talked about Fiat Chrysler, and I, I was mentioned many shows ago that I really hope they get into the electrified pickup truck game with the Dodge Ram. Well, they haven't really said anything until now. Now they've come out with an article to say that, you know, they feel that there could be a position uh, for electrified pickup trucks and that if their market potential is threatened that they may go into it. Hmm. Boy, I really wish that these guys would get out of the boardrooms and look at the state of the reality, I'll tell you that. But anyway, FCA is really waiting to see if they are, if they are going to invest in electrified pickup trucks, especially under the Ram brand or not. Um, you know, I'm telling you guys, you snooze, you lose. And the longer you guys wait, this is going to, this is a big market. We all know the SUV and pickup truck market is huge, especially in North America and certainly in some of the other parts of the world. So if they wait too long, they're going to miss the boat on this because Tesla with the Cybertruck, you've got Rivian, you've got Ford actively pursuing that game. GM has already come out and said they're going to tackle that and others like Lordstown and so forth. Uh, FCA sits on their laurels too long. They're going to miss the boat. So uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Now, this is an interesting story from a Chinese manufacturer. We know that a lot of the manufacturers are making inroads into the North American marketplace, specifically into the U.S. marketplace, which is a big, big, huge market. A Chinese manufacturer of the candy models has now come out and said they are going to be bringing these models into the U.S. They're, they're coming with two models. One of them is the K27, and the other one is the K23. Now, the K27, as you see with pictures and video here, uh, it's a small four-seater, mainly urbanish type of vehicle with a 17.69 kilowatt hour battery pack with a acclaimed range of up to about 100 miles or about 160 kilometers. Um, those are probably NEDC uh, numbers. I don't think they're EPA for sure. But the price tag is interesting because it's going to come out uh, just under $13,000 US after federal tax credits. That's assuming that they'll qualify for that $7,500 initial tax credit. Wouldn't see why the program's still there. So that's a pretty compelling reason for somebody that might want a small urban runabout or just, you know, something to boot around the city or maybe go visit into the suburbs and get back and, and maybe charge at somebody's house or whatever. For a, a relatively small figure, you can get a decent vehicle. Now, the K Candy K23, that's going to be targeted a little bit a more expensive uh, audience. It's more bigger, of course, and it will come in around $23,000 U.S. or less after federal tax credits. Again, if they don't, it's under $30,000. It's $29,900 is the price. Now, it's a smaller crossover SUV-ish type of vehicle with a 41.4 kilowatt hour battery pack with uh, some type of uh, NCM chemistry that we are told and more than a 180 miles or 290 kilometers of range. So that's kind of taking it up in closer to that 200 mile club. Um, again, these are most likely NEDC ranges, so take them with a grain of salt. You can go check out their website for more, all the specs and details and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I'm always harping about affordability. 
Uh, and I'm glad to see these manufacturers come into the North American market to help maybe stimulate more EV adoption because, you know, EVs are still expensive, right? But they do cost more than your regular ICE counterpart. We are not at cost parity yet, so we need other vehicles to kind of help bring those prices down. Now, I don't know how much of a market share these guys are going to grab. A lot of uh, people in the U.S. are, a lot of people in general are weary about offshore manufacturers, especially in Asia, about the quality and things like that. But they do a good job, so let's wait and see what happens. And I really hope that they are successful in penetrating and getting some market share, because I think these are going to be good offerings for where they're suited. And last story today uh, is about busing. I've talked about buses for quite a while. Well, Edmonton here in Canada, the city of Edmonton in Alberta, Edmonton Transit Service has just unveiled uh, one of their first batch of long-range 40-foot Proterra Catalyst E2 Max electric buses. Whew, got to take a breath after that one. Uh, they're equipped with massive, uh, I think the largest battery packs in the industry. They're 660 kilowatt hour battery packs. They're pretty big. Um, the city of Edmonton and their transit system is going to deploy 40 of these buses. Uh, 21 have already been delivered with about uh, 19 to go. And they're estimated to drive around 350 kilometers or 218 miles on a charge, which is more than plenty enough for what these do, what these buses will do in a daily route or route, as you pronounce it. Now, apparently these buses did uh, set a world record in 2017 for the longest distance covered on a single charge. One bus was able to do 1,101.2 miles or 1,772 kilometers. Uh, so that's pretty good. Now, I don't know if that was going 10 miles an hour or 20 miles an hour or whatever it was, but it's pretty, pretty significant and it's very interesting to see that kind of range uh, proven out. So, and it turns out that the Edmonton Transit System or Transit Service is also the first customer in North America to put these buses into service. So congratulations on the city of Edmonton. Uh, these buses put out about 510 horsepower equivalent. Of course, we know torque is all the thing. Uh, they can go from zero to 20, which isn't a, doesn't sound like a lot, in under six seconds. That's pretty good for a bus, uh, you know, a 40-foot bus carrying, I don't know how many people, 50 people or something like that, maybe more. Um, and these uh, buses can propel 25, they can actually go up a 25% grade. So pretty steep inclines or declines that they can go up and down, uh, which is an idea options with some of the routes that are around Edmonton and some of the hilly areas. So good to see uh, buses continuing to make municipal and public transit areas, and I love to see more. All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show, episode 102. Hope you like the new look, uh, some of the, uh, the new transitions and titles that I've been using. I'm trying out some new software and editing, so hopefully this uh, makes your show a little bit nicer. Again, thanks everybody who watches on YouTube, who subscribes, who puts comments in. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please do. It's very important for me to do that, uh, and I'd love to hear your comments. I try to answer each and every comment that is out there. Also, humble thanks to my Patreon supporters. You know who you are. I always put them up at the end of each show. Thank you very much for that. I know these are trying times and I appreciate your continued support. I get some new Patreon supporters here and there. Thank you. If you're interested, check out the website. Also, everybody, please stay safe. Uh, my continued PSA on this, you know what you have to do. Follow your local health guidelines and continue to stay safe from the coronavirus and, and all the effects and impacts of that as we continue to open up. So please follow those rules. Um, you know, this is an exciting marketplace. Continue to watch. I know there's going to be a uh, telecast from Cadillac tonight uh, or uh, this week about their, their Lyric and all kinds of stuff happening. Uh, I've got some other road tests coming up in the, in the next uh, few weeks. So continue to stay tuned for that. And again, I love your feedback. So please um, you follow me on Twitter if you haven't. Send me an email. All the contact information is coming up at the end of the show. So until the next show, please, again, everybody stay safe and I'll see you when I see you. Take care. Bye-bye.